Hi all, our notable game today is another great game from the legend Bobby Fischer, or officially known as Robert James Fischer. This was back in 1962, 10 years before the amazing World Championship match, which was called like Match of the Century against Spassky, so 10 years before. In Match of the Century, one of the very finest games was game six, Many people think that's one of the finest. Fisher actually chose a Queen's game and declined as white. And expertly exploited the opponent's back with pawns. That is uh, considered like a positional masterpiece. And even Boris Spassky, at the end of that game, stood up and applauded Fisher. Now, this game I'd like to show you today is special in relation to game six, because it shows Fisher actually on the black side of the Tartagoa defense in the Queen's Gambit declined. This was against Mario Bertok. So Stockholm into zone 1962. D4, Fischer played D5, not the King's Engine defense, not the Nimzo. He played classically with the Queen's Gambit declined. Knight C3, Bishop E7. A little finesse to avoid Bishop G5. Knight F3, Knight F6, but now Bishop G5 anyway. Black castles, e3. And we have here now h6, asking the bishop, what does it want to do? The two main moves are taking and, and the bishop retreats. In this game, we see the bishop going back to h4. And Fischer uses the Tartkoa defense, named after Savely Tartkoa, one of the most famous wits in chess, very witty quotations from Tartkoa, which you should check out if you don't know them, many of them, very, very good. Quotation. So b6, Tartakoa defense. Now, one of the issues when you play the Tartakoa is the possibility of hanging pawns, what's called hanging pawns. It's a structural concession. And as with other structural concessions like isolated pawns, you need to make sure you've got sufficient piece activity to compensate or other factors to compensate. Uh, making a concessions like this, these double edged elements of the position. Uh, it's, it depends then how both sides can argue their case, how resourceful they are with their respective trump cards. We see how white playing c takes d5, and black plays knight takes d5, which is the more popular alternative, by far actually five times more popular than e takes. So the idea, it would seem to be that black really wants to exchange off the dark square bishops here and relieve some of the pressure on the king side rather than keeping that threat, bishop takes f6 alive and white can often build up pressure here, etc. Black's trying to relieve some of the tension by removing some of the pieces from the position. And white usually doesn't play knight takes d5 here. By the way, this is six games is equal, or even e takes d5 as well. And it's meant to be um, okay. So the usual move is actually bishop takes e7, and we have queen takes e7. Knight takes d5 is played now, quite usually. Uh, other moves are much rarer than this. If bishop d3, black can play bishop b7 and has avoided actually any structural issues. The pawn structure is quite solid here, and it's meant to be quite equal this position. This position here, black's actually quite solid. For example, like this, there's there's a few games from this position. So in this game, yeah, white takes the opportunity to play knight takes d5, e takes d5. It's not an isolated pawn, because there's a c pawn here, but it will become part of a, a pair of hanging pawns, or rather a set hanging pawn set after castles c5. These are hanging pawns. Once white plays d takes c5. Now black doesn't want to leave a fantastic blockade square doesn't want to take with his queen because that would be a fantastic blockade square against the isolated queen's pawn. So they're relatives, they're, they are logically related the hanging pawns and the isolated pawn, but black wants hanging pawns here. Now why would Fisher do this? In other games which are less complicated than chess and some element of luck, for example backgammon, uh, if you leave a loose counter you can often just lose the entire game. The opponent gets that counter, gets time, and you just lose the entire game. In chess, when you make a small concession, it's really, as I mentioned, it's the resourcefulness of both players to play on their trump cards. 
why ideally against the hanging pawns wants to have them fixed down blockaded uh, Fisher expertly played against hanging pawns as mentioned in game six of the 1972 match not only he fixed them down he then acquired good light square pressure and built up a kingside attack now here what is the compensation for black though black has piece compensation potentially on that b file with the pawns here this b file and this e file there might be a nice outpost square here except there's only one knight so really the most significant feature it seems for compensation purposes is this b file and there's a great parking spot for the queen actually to ib2 in a way this is you know like a, a backward pawn in any case against the hanging pawns white plays queen a4 and we see queen b7 so some pressure on b2 compensates the hanging pawns at the moment queen a3 and they kept fluid at the moment they're not moved forward as i mentioned it would create a blockade square if it's moved forward we have knight d7 keeping the pawns fluid now here white actually plays knight e1 this would seem quite logical not only it provides bishop f3 but also knight d3 black plays a5 though and actually black's queen coming to b4 represents an issue as well as potentially doubling on b2 knight d3 is this so convincing the play from white here with the knight isn't this knight subject to tempo gains could they be useful that is the key question with white's plan knight e1 it looks good on paper but tactically in the brutality of forcing moves on the chessboard is this a good plan because fisher actually gives white exactly what he wants he doesn't keep this pawn fluid with saying a rook move he actually moves the pawn forward so he's fixing down the pawns now he's giving a potential blockade square but what point is there of a blockade square if a knight can't easily reroute to d4 here how long would it take to reroute to d4 how would it actually do that it goes to f4 so fisher's given this blockade square under much more favorable circumstances than before and he's still got his compensation b file pressure which he makes use of immediately and we have rook a b1 and now it seems the knight's justified because it's putting pressure on d5 and as if white's neatly going to just double rooks and play bishop f3 that would be the ideal scenario for white to reach and in fact that'd even be a pin on the queen here and white would be laughing all the way to victory potentially but fisher now puts a spanner in the works in this position that b file pressure is not insignificant compensation he tries to prove this with bishop f5 letting go of the d5 pawn to attack the rook but the rook goes to d1 does fisher want to win this b2 pawn here in this position it's not so favorable to win b2 here it looks so white's got some very interesting possibilities let's have a check on this exact position on queen takes b2 actually even even this position if white actually plays rook takes d5 or knight takes d5 it seems actually fisher's position is still favorable even in this variation from an engine perspective small advantage so that's the strength of the position actually he could have just apparently just taken that but his move here is potentially technically stronger actually he doesn't want this trade of prisoners the Nimzovich expression uh trade of prisoners where both sides swap weaknesses why doesn't fisher want this trade of uh, prisoners and what what can we learn from that avoidance of the trade of prisoners here fisher actually plays knight f6 he protects his weak pawn he doesn't want to trade it for b2 just yet there's a specific issue in this position white has visualized this dream position but getting there you've got to cross that brutality in chess of forcing moves as mentioned so white's trying for his absolute dream position to put all the pressure on d5 and would even protect the the pawn on b2 and this would even pin the pawn on d5 surely this is madness then fisher could have gotten rid of d5 white now plays the move rook d2 aiming for that dream position but here 
Alas, the dream is shattered by Fisher with one move which the opponents may be. It didn't occur to the opponent. It's one of those moves that people don't often calculate too much. But Fisher has a very, very important move which justifies the avoidance of the trade of weaknesses or the trade of prisoners in the Mizovich metaphor and justifies uh, the compensation Fisher has on the B file. Can you see this move that Fisher plays in this position which really changes the picture here and shows how dangerous actually hanging pawns can be in the harsh reality of chess that actually even though they're fixed now and d5 seems to be victimized two steps away from a perfect looking position but what is the move Fisher placing if I give you five seconds starting from now g5 it's a forcing move the forcing move here helps justify the overall entire philosophy of black here with the hanging pawns people that play the Tartico defense if they're good they must surely realize this that okay they accept structural concessions they accept the pawns might be fixed but there might be tactical opportunities there might be pressure opportunities forcing moves can change the picture of chess games rapidly here the knight hasn't got a good square it's one move away if only the rooks had been doubled or bishop f3 it's one move away now it has to go away from f4 doesn't really want to retreat to h3 he played actually knight takes d5 getting two pawns for the knight if mario bartok plays knight h3 another forcing move knight e4 shows how miserable the position is here for white for example rook c2 which looks silly as an example knight g3 is hitting everything if the rook stays on the d file more sensibly queen takes b2 and this is just massively favorable for black this position this ending there's two past pawns on the way centralized knight versus decentralized city knight so this is just grim after knight e4 this position is to be avoided rook d2 uh just just uh yeah if, if the rook goes back it's still you know b2 or taking on h3 first it's that's lost so yeah white plays desperately a piece sack knight takes d5 so we have knight takes d5 bishop takes c4 fisher just protects the knight here after rook fd1 has white had enough coffee on on the day of this game black has another crushing tactical blow here to remove any compensation white might have in terms of the two pawns makes it even worse now fisher's next move is can you guess if i give you five seconds starting from now to test your tactics okay it's a loose piece and that should give the alarm bells to you when you see a loose piece double attacks loose pieces often drop off here knight takes e3 double attack queen takes g2 mate bishop takes knight takes multiple attacks now after knight takes e3 white can't handle all of them with the same move he plays queen takes e3 so after bishop takes c4 yeah it's only a pawn for a piece it's lost h4 trying to crack open black's king a bit desperately rook e8 kicking the queen queen e7 protecting things bishop drops back f4 now this is dealt with with just g4 we have h5 check here after bishop f5 white resigned now this game you might think isn't it a bit simple it's historically significant the reason i'd like i'm showing in this game it's historically significant because the 1972 match game six with the hanging pawns on the white side fisher on the white side it's very interesting to me and i hope to you to see fisher on the black side playing the task of defense himself having the hanging pawns himself how does fisher 
use the trump cards of the hanging pawns it seems you know the stronger the player is the more they're going to add their, they're going to make the case for their side of the argument so these double-edged aspects of the position which in other games are often terminal in chess the deal isn't completely done it doesn't spell a lost game by default the deal isn't done it's up to the resourcefulness of both players to prove their case to argue their case of both sides of the coin so this is a quite a clear example of fisher arguing the case for hanging pawns if white plays a bit too routinely and knight e1 to d3 on the surface looks good but when it's on f4 it's subject to forcing moves g5 very important forcing move and with that black's using that b file trump card he didn't want the exchange of prisoners d5 for b2 no he uses the b b file trump card and he's winning after that and it looks like an easy win shortly after what was a recipe for exploiting the hanging pawns then being fixed it's not the end of the story the deal isn't done yet the resourcefulness of both players influences how you play these double-edged positions these double-edged aspects and it's a classic pawn structure versus peace activity in compensation and forcing moves it's a classic trade-off situation but the stronger you are the more you can argue the case on both sides of the board and fisher shows with this game he can play with white he can play with black and his resourcefulness can sometimes let him win with either color playing with the structure uh, on his side or with him imposing having structural weaknesses but having the peace compensation okay so i hope you got something from this comments or questions on youtube thanks very much